Okay, welcome back to another video, folks. In today's interview, I'm catching up with the Gone Girls, Claire and Gail, who attended trainings at our farm and took a startup fund from the Ecosia project that we ran. And they've been doing excellent work in Normandy in France. So great to have them back and hear how things are developing for them. Uh, Claire and Gail, thanks so much for joining us. And maybe you could give us a little overview of what Gone Girls is for people who have forgotten or haven't seen you on the channel before. Mm -hmm. there go. Okay, so I'm Gail, I'm French, uh, almost 40. Um, and so we started Gone Girls with Claire in, so we had the idea in 2016, moved to Normandy in 2019. I used to work in impact finance uh, in agriculture investments, but uh, far from the field. And I have uh, yeah, two kids now, eight and three. Um, and we moved here to start a small, diverse farm uh, focused on regenerative agriculture. We also wanted to demonstrate that you can be two women and have a successful farm. Uh, our objective is to demonstrate that uh, you can regenerate the soil and also be profitable at the same time. And we have now um, four different activities. So we have a thousand uh, chickens, organic. Uh, we have a market garden that's very small, 1,500 square meters. Uh, we have a guest house and we have uh, horses as well. So attention to horses. And I'm Claire, um, I'm South African and I am 40. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I moved to France 12 years ago, um, so still very uh, South African in my mindset, I think, but now uh, I'm also French and, um, and the farm was part of, we have 14 hectares, it was a, a farm that was part of my husband's family kind of inheritance that was about to be sold and we we bought it from his family. Hmm. And people might remember you from the uh, the Ecosia incubator program thing. So you took funding from that, that was what, to start up the agricultural side of things? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, so that was 2019 and we got uh, 50,000 euros to start the business. Actually, the company wasn't even created, so it was great because it, uh, I mean, no one uh, could have financed us at this point. And yeah, we financed uh, the greenhouses, uh, the, the chickens, first chickens, the tractor, feed, tractor, yeah, first uh, plants and seeds. So they yeah. really allowed us to get going. Yeah, absolutely. And now we've um, just refinanced it with the bank at a much mm. lower interest rate. Perfect. And it was, it's a bit uh, peculiar in France, you have to have gone through basic agricultural training to be able to what run a farm business uh, to, to, yeah. to own a farm business yeah so you have yeah. to be european as well um mm. which we found out quite late so i got my french passport quite quickly um and then you can own land but it's not necessarily true that you can exploit it is the word mm. that they use uh, unless you come from a farming family. So if you come from a farming family, you're fine. Um, but we had to do a year of the equivalent of the final level of school um, mm. on, in farming. Yeah. Very and that one, theoretical. How, did, how did that go for you? It was interesting. Uh, I don't think we <laughs> learned a lot on the practical side. I mean, we, had, uh, we did some um, internships at farms too. Uh, so we learned a bit, but it was a lot about uh, how agriculture works in France, the different institutions. A lot uh, about the PAC, about the um, European uh, subsidies. Yeah, and accounting and cash flows, but it's all marketing, how to sell your product. So it's uh, stuff that we knew from our previous uh, professional lives. Mm. So we, we didn't learn much on the concrete side, but we learned about how agriculture works in France. So it was also interesting to talk to people who were not organic or not regenerative and talk to them about the challenges they face, uh, why they don't really believe in it. It's, it's, uh, but it it's gave us a bit of a legitimacy to say, oh, we went and then they're like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, being, being, uh, not, not being from an 
agri family uh, being two women coming from Paris we and and we wanted to do this farm with many different activities like like girls and people thought it was a bit weird so having this diploma really helped us to yeah definitely have some credibility at the sure. beginning yeah. yeah and where would you describe like where's the business at now like you've been ramping up and are you still in the process of expanding and growing or are you reaching some place where it's starting to level off like how would you describe where you're at right now could you tell us <laughs> <laughs> you don't know <laughs> no well, no it's not true no i think now, now it's it, we had two years of uh, growth and setting up everything at the same time so we started in the middle of COVID and we had just a table and three salads and, uh, and some turnips. So that was it. And, and we didn't have staff. We started just, just the two of us. And so during two years, we had to adjust to, to the demand, especially for eggs, um, change a bit our business plan because some activities here grew more than expected. And now it works. I think the market garden, uh, well, all the activities worked quite well. Uh, the question is more, how do we make it more efficient? How do we really organize ourselves mm. to make sure that we have someone responsible for everything? I think now we'd like to, with Claire, develop new projects linked to the production, but not necessarily being, you know. Yeah, we've kind of set up this year will be 60% in the fields and 40% on special projects. So it could be uh, renovating another building. Um, it could be um, consulting. It could be events, like just to have the time to, we've got so many ideas and never, we didn't have any time to, mm. not time, probably energy to mm. be able to take on anything. You've had quite a lot of renovation work just to be able to live there, I guess, right? And then you're also, building up infrastructure to be able to rent which you did yeah. before I guess but and, it's and quite a lot of buildings that you've got responsibility for definitely and I think also we took a the right view in the beginning especially around the farm stuff is um, everything is very temporary in terms of our infrastructure so we just have our greenhouses but even the irrigation we did it with yellow garden hoses to see kind mm -hmm. of where we actually need irrigation and how we use it and now it's starting to feel like we can actually make proper decisions and start digging pipes in and hmm. and making life a little bit easier than hauling yellow pipes around the field or after the chickens you know hmm. yeah so there's a uh, yeah, buildings is something that we're doing step by step because we we, we can't take more uh, loans i think <laughs> we're at them at the limits and so we have to do it ourselves now um and we really want to get those buildings done to be able to have space for employees to eat to stay and also organize some training Events we don't have stuff, a, yeah. yeah we don't have a space to to mm. to hold training um so yeah that's going to be a uh, a lot of the work and we also wanted to work a bit more on the regenerative uh, practices for horses because it's something that has just uh, like it's not very developed in France and we are surrounded by horses so we believe there is demand mm. um, so we're building the knowledge from Claire uh, particularly because <coughs> she's the horse uh, the horse woman yeah it's super interesting so tell us tell us more about that because people always ask about what how you could integrate horses into this kind of thing so i mean it's so complicated um i think it comes down to the fact that like all the grazing stuff is done for cows mm. um, and uh, all the grass has been bred to do high sugar high sugar um grass varieties and um, horses are the exact opposite of cows so they are made to eat um, a lot of poor quality forage um, and they don't have that rumination at the back so it goes through so they've got to eat a huge amount of very 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 um, low quality uh, quality grass um, in order for them to be, be uh, to be good and if they eat too much high sugar they can swell up and they can get all mm. kinds of health issues they also have a different mouth structure. So their teeth can really get down to the short, short, short parts of the grass, um, which means they land up eating stressed grass a lot compared to a cow, which just can't get down there. 
So it's really interesting. Um, we're in a European work group um, with the Savory guys in Europe um, around this question, because I think that it was one quarter of all agricultural land in Germany is linked to horse production. It's insane. Um, and so this is, by, when you say horse production, just for listeners, that's like people with horses on a horses couple of acres. and Or um, producing feed for horses. So right. whether it's the lucerne or um, hay or grain um, or race courses or, you know, like it's just, it's, it's a massive amount of land. Mm. Um, and the interesting part of that is that um, most people who have horses aren't farmers. They have land because they have horses. Yeah. And so it's actually from the, the people we've been speaking to and the educators around this, they say that it's a very easy to change horse people's practices because they're not tied to a system. Uh, they just kind of do the best they can. Um, and so we're doing, so um, we're working with Jane Myers from um, Equi Central. Um, she's British, but she spent 25 years in Australia. Um, and it's about using um, holistic grazing, but also having a central parking area, which is not a sacrifice paddock, but more a space where they have um, cover and the hay is there and the water is there. Um, because also we land up hauling a lot of water for horses mm. around the property. Mm. Um, and so um, they always come back because horses have to move a lot. So they always come back to the central space and it's a big enough space that when your grass isn't ready for them because they need it to be a lot higher than ideally you need it to be that in that high um, low starch high fiber phase um, you then let them out into smaller paddocks at night particularly when the energy has already been stored so mm -hmm. um it's super interesting it's the same stuff but um with very different objectives you're not trying to fatten up your horse like a cow sure yeah. Is that is that managed like purely through fencing? Uh, fencing and um, one central spot of of, um, uh, of cover. So really, um, uh, what do we call it? Terraced, like a like stabilized land stabilized. that is mm -hmm. not grass, with some sort of wind and shade. Mm. So you do need a little bit of. Uh, we we it, we looked at using movable cover, movable. Uh, um, uh, shade uh, and it, the problem is that you just land up in mud because they park themselves underneath right. that um, and uh, horses need a, a cover that always has two uh, I mean a, a, shed, a shed that always has two entrances and exits so that they can avoid each other mm -hmm. it's not like a cow. so it's super interesting um, we know a lot we're not really completely sure how it's going to affect our infrastructure yet but we've got the buildings for it so yeah. it, it will be fine. We'll probably use our cow barn and adjust some stuff. But do you have do you have any good resources off the top of your head for people that are interested in horses? Yeah, so um, I I'm really enjoying this um, Equi Central course. Uh, Jane Myers. Um, it's really not expensive. I think it's a hundred euros or something because she's got and she's got six books on it as well. Um, so really really worthwhile. Mm. Uh, looking at that and then otherwise um as the as the european savory group will start really kind of just writing up our our uh, experiences on it um we we did however i think it's quite important to say we managed to put in the same amount of organic matter into our land with horses as we did with chickens this year oh great we did our mm. tests so we haven't been doing bad for badly for the soil but the horses are a little bit too fat i think but hang on, that's quite significant, right? Because I don't know what those calculations are, but with the chickens, you're importing food, right? So it's yeah. quite significant. Yeah. yeah. And with the horses, we're not even giving them hay when they're on the big pasture. It just takes more space <laughs> to have the horses. You need, yeah. you need land, land. And it's yeah. multiple hectares. Now we have 11 horses. Um, it's a bit of a... Yeah. A stretch. There are moments in the year where yeah. we have too much grass and there are moments when we have not enough. Mm. But with horses, it's easy to give them a bit of hay or mm. I mean, even to give them additional grain. It's not it's not going to bankrupt you if you need to. And the context of the horses is you both enjoy horses, but you also 
uh, people are putting their horses on your land too, right? Yeah, we only have one that is uh, my horse, and then the rest are um, stabling uh, mm. or pen. Uh, what have, I don't even know, yard clients. Um, and so we have, yeah, 10 mm. at the moment, with probably two more coming. Mm. And are they actually in a cycle of grazing with the poultry? Because that's obviously putting yeah. a lot of nitrogen in the ground and enriching the ground. So they only crossed over for a very, probably yeah. on a hectare yeah. Yeah. last year. And when we did mm -hmm. the testing on the organic matter in the ground, we didn't take it. We took it from where the chickens hadn't been. So we did it just with horses. Um, but it's very, there are a lot of cross um, um, illnesses that can go between, from chickens to horses. Right. So we try and really keep them as separate as possible and maybe throw the chickens into the field afterwards. Mm -hmm. the, the regulation for chickens is quite, so I don't know how, it's, how it is in Sweden, but you, you really need to have an area dedicated to, to chickens, in fact, so you can't really cross animals too much, or it needs to be really the area for chickens where you change shoes and there's no, like the tractor cannot go through the field with horses and then go to the chickens, it has to be quite separate, so in fact we can from one year to another, they can go into the same paddocks, but the process for a same year has to be quite separate. Okay, you know, is that because of bird flu and? Yeah, it's, it's, of, uh, it's hygiene. Yeah. Hygiene and yeah. biosecurity. security, yeah. You had, how's it been with bird flu? Because you folks had permission to have your birds outside with netting over the entire structure, right? Yeah, that was last year, never again. Yeah. <laughs> like, was, like uh, just to describe it you had a huge like almost like a fruit net like you'd have over fruit trees right across the entire over into a, onto a tree. paddock we had a smaller yeah. paddock that we put the chickens into and through them because mm. it, the, why we did that was because we had a new we had new chickens arrive in march yeah um and the bird flu wasn't lifted yet so we couldn't put them into another greenhouse because we already had the original band in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we had to put them outside. And, and so we needed it for tomatoes and stuff. Yeah. So we. And what was the there. issue with that? Like, obviously, it's hard to move that. I well, guess. We didn't move. Yeah, we didn't move for six weeks basically until the things lifted, and um, it got really muddy very quickly. I mean, you land up spending your day mm. in chicken crap. Not really fun at all. Mm. It so, got, got muddy. We started having some, some, also some. Would you say parasites? Parasites. Yeah, parasites. parasites. Uh, if you can see the foamy sheets, and you're like, okay, this is not it's time. Well. It's time. Time to move. And uh, it was a bit of a pain to take the nets um, off as well. Yeah. So we tried something this year. So the bird flu started in like November. Yeah. And so we tried to put the egg, the egg mobiles in front of the tunnel, in, in front of the greenhouses without taking out the, the nests. And that didn't work at all because they started laying under the egg mobiles because mm -hmm. they were cozy and, and dark. They were not going really into the nests anymore. So we took the nests out, put them into the, the greenhouses. So two greenhouses now. And they automated the nest so we didn't have to get up to it. Really. <laughs> so, yeah, we had to automate <laughs> the, the nest opening like in at the hill farm. Uh, so that worked well. But we had, after a few months there, yeah, we, um, we had a disease that started and that spread pretty quickly. So, this is when we said, okay, they're starting to be nervous, the chickens are stressed. Uh, we see some, some parasites again, so we ask for an authorization to just take them out. So we have to feed them inside and we have to put the water inside, but they can have a grass area around the, the greenhouses that they can, you know, mm -hmm. they can use. And that works quite, uh, it was quite it well. It makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah, they're much better since they've been outside, they're more relaxed. Uh, it, it's, animals it are really everything. not meant to be inside, <laughs> really. Yeah. <laughs> So um, we, we also next year will probably review a bit our grazing plan to make sure that there is a, a part of the field next to the greenhouses where they can go throughout winter and bird flu. Mm. I think that would be yeah. the best. How, how have you found it dealing with the authorities? Because it seems like they've given you some like flexibility. 
like with in terms of like being able to have the birds outside with nets and in terms of getting exemptions that can often be really hard to to get but it seems like you've had a good experience with that but they said no once um they said no last year for us to give them an ex an outside the uh, yeah thing um, mm -hmm. we improved uh, we followed their recommendation we improved our systems and uh, and um, like ticked some boxes we had claire with our with her south african uh, mentality mentality asking why five times until they were saying i don't know it's just it's just like that <laughs> <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so when they couldn't answer our questions they're like okay do it uh, whatever and so uh, they said okay we, we have to in the end if the result is that there is no disease and we follow uh, five like general rules they're fine we have a uh, the, the, the how do you say the obligation of the result? Uh, yeah, the obligation of the result rather yeah. than the obligation of the method of the method. Right. Mm. So that worked. Uh, Which that is worked good. well. But we have. And we also we we knew it. This the last year we just asked for a derogation. We just said, oh, can you let us, can you let us let our birds out? And they were like, no. <laughs> and this year, with the moment we got an autopsy result back saying that there was this bacteria, um, we were like quickly ask for the derogation like do it now 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 because at least uh, even if it clears up yeah we can say uh, no no it's bad for the birds and mm. and there's a lot of um, press around it at the moment there's a lot yeah. of the the unions the ag agricultural unions not the big one but the smaller ones are really fighting to say how can you say that eggs are free range if for six months of the year they have to be stayed and they have to stay inside yeah um and there's been a lot of a lot of kind of striking and yeah. writing of stuff so mm. and that's helped and we we wrote a letter explaining that in the end the objective of, of all those rules was just to prevent uh death uh, and in the end we had so many issues with the birds inside that there were death anyway and it had the economic impact on us which was huge and on animal welfare as well and uh, and that yeah we, we we preferred to let them out following Again, certain rules. Certain yeah. rules. We, we live and learn. We figured it, figured it out better this year. Yeah. Mm. Very good. You've been having that sort of communication with them. It sounds like it's been fruitful. Yeah. Mm. You said that you're aiming to put 60% on the field and 40% on other projects, like for balance, I guess, and to, to see other things through. And I wonder what's the experience for you both being up to this point? Like how how much have you put yourselves through in terms of workload? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were at 150% for year, definitely. Yeah. Well, maybe just um, to put it into context, the first year it was just the two of us with a few interns. Woofers. And Woofers kind of like spotted in and out because we didn't feel we were able to um, manage people while we were doing our first year, but we took in certain interns just to say to them, because it's an opportunity also to see a farm in its first year, I think, but it wasn't necessarily the most successful mm. human experience for us. Uh, we felt like we got eaten up. And then the second year we employed Nina who um, is now with us this year as well. Um, and she's amazing. Uh, she's really a, become a third, a third partner on the farm. Um, and she's really reliable and she thinks the same way we do. So she took a lot of mm. pressure off of us last year. And then this year we have Nina and Karen um, who are coming, Karen's joining us at the end of Feb. So we'll have two employees and um, two interns for the season who come through a program of, it's almost like an apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that they will be there. They are signed into this program to do it. So we've got a base team of six for this year. Mm -hmm. And then we have some interns that are in um, um, either in engineering, agricultural engineering school or in uh, BP, mm -hmm. into that diploma that we had to do um yeah. for yeah throughout the year so we kind of have staffed up but trying to put in a lot more structure into it so that's open. also what facilitates you folks to have more yeah. time to look at other projects as well and exactly and also yeah. to have because uh, the learning was also that you 
uh, there are always emergencies and expected uh, things to manage at the farm. And so we were really spending our time managing um, emergencies. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all the time and, and so we couldn't spend two hours sitting on, on a desk to work on the project because someone would always come to ask uh, that, oh there's a chicken run a thousand chickens outside come and help us the horse is on the road or uh, water doesn't work or whatever and so I said okay it's better to have a team that's a bit bigger than what we need but just in case someone is on holiday or after what happened with Claire also last year you know if someone has to go for family reasons we we, we have enough staff and we can work on those those more long those longer term projects that mm. allow us to take the farm where we want it to be because otherwise it's just uh, running around <laughs> yeah craziness crisis response crew that sounds yeah. like really being able to build resiliency in there which is a nice place to be in i guess yeah but our motto us... is uh, uh, manage tomorrow's emergencies <laughs> <laughs> How about your, like the partnership between you two? You were obviously close friends before this, and how is that now? <laughs> hate each other. <laughs> We're still close friends. We still managed to have dinner after a day of farm work. Yeah, and... we had dinner last night. It was really nice, just the two of us. <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been also um, a process because we were friends before, but we, we didn't know each other as well as we do now when Claire was talking about the, the, it's like being in a couple really but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so you, we we got to know each other in again crisis situations where you you discover how the other one reacts mm -hmm. you got to know okay what are we, we our skills or competencies what we like what we don't like what we're really good at what we're not good at and so it took us like a good year I think yeah. of uh, talking as well and Saying, okay, I see that you're stressed. Uh, what's going on? Or oh, you've been shouting a lot last, <laughs> last week. <laughs> Be nice to me. What's wrong with you? <laughs> um, and um, and and then we started splitting the tasks uh, in May last year. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, there's a lot to do now. Farm is growing. We need to. We can't continue to do everything together. We need to have our areas of responsibility. So um, that helped. Um, and now I think we we know each other quite well, so we are able to identify uh, quite early the signs of uh, mm. you know when we're tired or. So but I think yeah, it's it's quite a um, I mean it's quite a thing to I I'm very pleased that we weren't very close beforehand because I think you come in with a lot of baggage if mm. you do know each other very well, um, and then. Yeah, I think it, it really is like a crash course in marriage uh, because you have to kind of like look after this person while looking after yourself, while making sure that um, you don't take everything too personally, but you take the right things personally. And, um, and, you, and of course, we have also our husbands with us as well. So there's also this dynamic of a foursome as well. Um, and we live together in the same space. So we all have different um, uh, relationships with uh, material things, with the way we want to live, with our aspirations. And, and it's quite interesting to kind of understand that. And I read one book about partnerships, the only one I could find, where they were saying it's, it is a type of marriage, except that you talk about money all the time <laughs> and there's no sex. <laughs> 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 which can be a good thing and a bad thing who knows but um but you like you have this weird relationship where you're incredibly close and you're talking about one of the the subjects which is highly emotional mm. all the time um yeah. and our so it's also made us look at our personal relationships to money uh to how having less money affects you having more money affects you how we want to feel if if we want to take a massive loan how we would feel in terms of independence and and we also have two different very different family lives gail's got two kids we don't have any um and so we've got we're also building for different futures you know mm -hmm. so it's i guess there's like obviously pros and cons as opposed to doing that with your husband you know like either one of you doing this sort of project with a husband that it, i can imagine though that that's nice to like it sounds like it's complex in one way to have that 
sort of meshing of two families as it were but it's can you see like it would be easier or harder to do that with a life partner as opposed to a a friend partner. Uh, uh, never, never, never do that with my life partner. And I think same for Claire. We, when we, we would maybe do it with each other's yeah, husbands, but not with our own. <laughs> no, no, never, ever. Because no, it's, it's, a, it's such an interesting thing, right? Because there's so many young couples starting yeah. these sort of farms. And it's, it's really tough, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I, I like, think we see the benefits that come from being two couples is, is massive. Um, the, the real benefit of like having a weekend off and both being able to go, like each of us being able to go away with our mm. partner and really have mm. time, which is amazing. You know, and not a lot of people get that. Um, and also having people living on the farm, but who are exterior to the farm, who give us input, you know, who say like, oof, there you said something that would maybe a little bit over or um, no, you need to put down your tools and get, go to bed because uh, it's time. It's important to have that external view on what we're doing mm. and, and support um, mm. that they give us. But um, I, I couldn't do it with, no, I couldn't yeah. do it with Zav. And he knows, I mean, he's with us and he helps us a lot, but mm. um, I think it would ruin our relationship. Yeah, same for me. Yeah. What do what do your husbands think of what you're up to? Shame they get so uh, upset because everyone just wants to talk about the farm all the time. No, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a joke. Um, no, they're very supportive. Yeah, we're very really lucky. They they have very different ways of being involved. Their their uh, close husband is very involved. He actually he's doing the shop at the farm with us. He loves selling, so he, he likes our clients, and he's always there on Saturday mornings and. Uh, um, he and mows he the loam. He, he does the gardening <laughs> a lot, which is great because we don't have to do it. Uh, my partner is less involved. He does a bit of um, the, he takes care of the bees. Uh, he does the honey harvest with my grandfather, but he mostly takes care of the kids. In fact, which is great because uh, mm. that frees uh, some some time for me. But yeah, he's he's not uh, he's less involved. He's really more of doing the family. Uh, well, and he has um, like projects, like he wants to do a DVD like yeah. shop. He's built, a, he's built a sauna, which he which is sauna, quite nice. <laughs> and uh, did the DVD? He wants to do this DVD like association where people can come back to DVDs instead of using the Amazon servers and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so that's done. So Seymour has his own projects within the farm. Yeah. But he's integrated into it, and mm. so. Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Yeah, they're, they're very supportive. Mm -hmm. so they, they, I think they, they like being at the farm. They like their lives here. Um, mm -hmm. And they have all the nice sides without having all the heavy work. <laughs> so sure. It's really great for them. What about the, tell us more about the partnership thing with, like you're talking a bit about money and how does that work? Because you're, I mean, you've got a private side where you're, I'm guessing some of the building renovations is to do with your private life in your home and sharing a home. Like, do you share the home equally? And then the business, do you two share that equally? How, does, how have you sort of figured your way with that? So, the, uh, yeah, so it took us a year to find the right structure and we talked to many different uh, like uh, lawyers and experts to advice and we considered all the cases you know if uh, one of us dies if we all die if we if we if there is a divorce if we you know we we have a fight and everything so in the end we decided to split the farm in three there's the part that belongs to the four of us that we own uh, the four of us 25 percent then we have uh, simon and i have our own house and part of the field and claire and xavier have their own uh, but there is a door there is a door, yeah. That door. That in. <laughs> <laughs> but the house is yeah, next to each other, and we can always keep the door open and close it when we want to have privacy. So we, we have separate kitchens, we have separate living rooms. So it's really two separate houses with that little door in, mm -hmm. in between and share the washing machine. Um, and, so, and so the farm, yeah, we own the buildings all together, but Gone Girls rents those buildings. So at Barn Girls, it's just um, the, the two, two of us, 50%. at 50, 50 yeah. So the, the whole renovation work for the houses, it was for Xavier and Claire, their own, you know, money and uh, 
and loan, same for us. And then for the farm, uh, we took a loan for um, guest house. the guest house that, that's on, the, on the, the structure where the four of us are. Uh, and then there is also a loan for gun girls, but the loan for gun girls is really not for the buildings. It's, it's just for the farm, like equipment, tools, and- the kosher, to pay back the kosher and to yeah. get our, our um, treasure, uh, treasury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, and then the building work that we want to do is more linked to the farm farm so um we've got a lot of um opportunity i think around um uh having an internal space where people can gather so we are um hosting a, a ceremony for one of the farming associations now they need a space uh so we can do it in the shop but if we do it in the shop, we have to move everything out. And so we just want to give one dedicated space to that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of transforming of our products into either like canned stuff or really like uh, catering. How does it work? I'm still interested in the financial thing because of like you have, have you found out that you have different sort of ways of relating to money or do you feel quite comfortable together with the sort of shared economic decisions you need to make like how how's that yeah. been in in I terms of planning the farm and then having your separate lives and obviously you've got children Gail, yeah. it's like you have different contexts in that way no, there, there is so for all the in the the decisions that relate to really the pure farming business we take together and we're pretty we're aligned so we never wanted yeah. to get like um, to to like a big loan to do massive investments we're really doing it step by step responding like testing the market responding to demand and when we have a good sense of what we what people want and need then we invest but we we start doing ourselves really and when it works and then then we we go to the next level mm -hmm. in terms of revenues we, we we're paid the same salary since uh, last year we we have uh, mm -hmm. the minimum uh, <laughs> monthly wage with, which is a uh, 1300 euros a month each which um is not a lot so um and and i mean we've been doing the two of us some consultancy on the side to be able to uh, yeah, pay the mortgages and uh, and also for me yeah the kids because it's definitely also an expense although Claire has uh, two dogs and a horse which are I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I don't know but, um, but yeah so for me it's been more stressful I, I, the fact that I have two kids and that's more revenue has been a bit of a stress um, and and more than Claire probably uh because yeah it's uh and they're growing up and uh, the older one is turning eight and so yeah the, the expenses are also increasing um and uh so yeah i have a i have a different like another job next to the farm where i'm doing those consultancies i used to do it at night and now i do it during the day <laughs> which is better because i was really uh it was really too hard so that's going to be the question going forward how we how we balance it i'm trying to manage my uh, my stress around the money but the fact is that I, today i still have more expenses than revenues if i only had the farm i couldn't uh, pay for my my expenses so i still have to 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 have that that complementary revenue and uh, we'll see going forward. I think this year is going to be a bit of a test to see how much the farm can pay us. And if there is still a need to have a complementary revenue, um, then we'll see, maybe that's we'll reduce the, the time on the farm. And uh, that's, that's a discussion I think that we, yeah. we're both open to have. And same for Claire. Uh, yeah, totally. I think there's a, like, we're definitely looking at increasing passive revenue. I mean, the guest house is a dream because it's just in and out. And, Mm. time spent is very very low so we're like we've got yeah. buildings why aren't we not doing more um accommodation mm. so it's definitely like we're definitely we're looking at things that will now add value either to our products so that we can sell them for more um because we pay each other we pay ourselves minimum wage but no one told us we had to pay ourselves minimum wage right we just took that number that the government gave us mm. and we gave ourselves that but there is no reason fundamentally why we aren't getting paid 300 euros more the business is running well um, but we are, are being kind of risk adverse 
Um, and I think there is, there are definitely um, different uh, histories, different uh, relationships with money that have um, that have influenced the way we and and the different futures that we look at it, that have um, influenced our ways. I, I've always had this thing where I, I always know I'm gonna I will have enough money. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> I know I can also live on nothing, so it also helps, you know. <laughs> uh, how, so how are you planning to, to manage the growth of the farm from here? Are you trying to... We're going to take 3 million euros and we're going to put robots in, <laughs> which we did have a call about, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's true. No, I think also with the, um, that thing related to money, that we could pay ourselves more, but we decided to have more people on the farm because mm. cash flow yeah. is, is also an, an, an issue. Mm. And instead of uh, paying ourselves 2,000 euros a month, we said, okay, maybe we want to take it easier and have more people on the farm. And so that's, that's yeah. an additional expense, but to, to take it like... Uh, and that might be slowly. the reality of the farm is that mm. it can't actually pay each one of us the equivalent of two minimum wages, but it can pay four salaries. Yeah, mm. we're very proud of still to, after yeah. two years, and so yeah. for the for the next uh, for the next phase, um, we don't want to go to increase the number of chickens, so we don't want to increase the size of the market garden. We might um, add uh, more horses, add more horses, but that's also passive income, right? It's yeah. very low input. It's a check every morning. When things go badly, they go really badly, but when things go well, which is ninety percent of the time, it's really low. Yeah. And it's mm. a good income, and the guest house is really what we want to leverage because it's a it's a nice building. It's in a very touristic area, and we have we're lucky to have Claire who cooks. Uh, it, like she's an amazing cook. We have space to host people to have dinners, seminars. So we would like to leverage a bit the services around mm. the farm. Uh, now we have a good in, like visibility, a good brand that people know. So we'd like to yeah focus on activities that generate more margin than the pure production and be able to yeah. like process it or value it in a in a different way than just direct selling basically. So that's we don't want to grow in necessarily in terms of size, but it's just going to be the the, the activities that are going mm. to to change and the and the in the margin basically. Yeah. And gives you girls like some diversity compared to just doing all the repetitive farm trials all of the time. Like to have employees that can, so you can do other things at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, and also focus on yeah, improvements because when you're uh, sometimes when you are doing the chickens, you know, you're just uh, thinking about, okay, I have to collect, I have to feed, I have to sort. But when it's someone else doing and they come with the problem, the fact that you're not involved in the daily operations helps you to find is, uh, like easy solutions and be able mm. to fix the problem. When you do it once a week, when it's your day on, like, oh, yeah. okay, that could be better. And like, okay, it's very easy to get stuck in, in just doing things the way you've done them because you're so full up with what needs doing that you haven't got time to innovate and fix problems. It feels like right? when you're doing manual labor with your hands, it's very hard to get your brain reconnected. Mm. For me, at least, I find like, even if we finish at six, I have no energy to start mm. thinking about interesting stuff. I'm just like, yeah. mm. I yeah. just wanted to pick up on going back to the horses. You said, I just noticed you said, 90% of the time it goes well, but if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Like, what would that be out of curiosity? Um, we had, um, well, we had a horse that got kicked while he was out riding, um, which then implies that you've got to put them inside into a small box and you've got to do the hospital stuff. So it's injections twice a day and changing uh, dressings and you know, really like veterinary work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we had just it only happened twice. We have a horse that um, it's called wind sucking. He like clamps onto the gate and then sucks back, but he clamps onto the gate. And so I didn't know this. And so I didn't put a chain on our gate. We just had a lock and uh, he un it unlocked the lock. And so all the horses were in the, on the other side the one morning, you know, you get a guy coming into the farm at six going, oh, your horses are on the road. Which was, wasn't true, they weren't on the road, but they were free, that's for sure. Um, or um, 
I don't know what else we've had. We had, yeah, a horse with an abscess. So you get a call on a Saturday afternoon saying there's a horse on three legs. Mm. Saturday afternoon, it's like, okay, mm. come on, start going. So even if the owners are there, you're, you're, it's in French, they call it like a good father of the house, good father of the family. Like that's your responsibility in the contract mm. that you have to look after these animals like mm. they are your own, mm. um, which is normal. But it means that, and it's always Saturday and Sunday. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, and they, and they can bash down fences and they can hurt themselves. And yeah. It's mostly okay, uh, so it's... You know, disease and, uh, and horses on the road. Basically. Yeah, fencing and mm. fencing and disease. Or um, get a call and someone's like, uh, I, I've fallen off. You've got to go catch my horse before he crosses the main road. Mm -hmm. They stop everything, run off, go catch a horse. And, mm. So it's kind of, I, yeah, it's relatable to any livestock, I guess. You've got to be there all the time. And when things happen, you just got to deal with them whatever yeah. time of day or night. Exactly, mm. yeah. Except they, they are very, they're not rustic, you know. Mm. We've got them to be very mm. sensitive ponies. So mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a one little cat can cause a massive problem. Yeah. And it, and you can have also, I mean, it's also not easy to get people to work for those horses because they're in herd, so they're not in individual paddocks. And when you have to go there and check them, they're all together. Sometimes they, you know, you can start galloping the team the, the, together. And so you have to be careful not to have injuries or there's also, mm. so now it's really clear looking at them, but we will probably, uh, yeah. Yeah, and when I go away, staff. it's not yeah. it's not the staff on the farm that looks after them. We employ somebody to come and do who's mm -hmm. got to do the checks, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, tell us a bit about because I guess for everyone in this field, it's a double-edged sword in terms of putting yourself like outward in terms of social media and exposing your brand and building up a a company and exposing yourself but then also needing to manage privacy and it's so typical of these kind of projects to draw people that want to come and see and they want to have a look round on sunday morning or whatever it is <laughs> tell us a bit about how that's been for you that never really. happens never <laughs> it was i think we had we had two uh two phases so the first when we when we um, we started during covid we had people coming so physically uh, um, knocking at our windows on a Sunday morning while you're having breakfast and you're still in your pajamas and people say, hi, I want eggs. And you say, oh, sorry, the, the shop is closed. Can you come back? And they, no, they want their eggs now because they came for it. And so it was a bit of a... Oh, we, we closed the fence once and then someone said, the fence was closed. <laughs> and just said, yeah. <laughs> You're not supposed to open the fence. So it was a bit, oh, we were in the middle of something in the garden and people were just coming and uh, because they had seen like uh, something on us in the newspaper. And so they just wanted to talk to us and ask questions. And, and we felt a bit in, yeah, at the beginning it was nice and we were taking the time to answer questions. So we were giving those eggs on the Sunday morning and we were giving tours of the farm. And after a while, it just became impossible to manage because it were, it, mm had too many people and it felt really uh because we have so many windows in our in our in our houses really we had really, really those people coming into our space mm -hmm. so we so we put some signage uh we haven't put any fence uh but we we try to to make it clearer on the farm what area is private what area is not private where where the shop is this is the guest house this is it still happens that you have people coming to our houses but less than than before so we're also less likely to jump up and i was always like oh there's someone uh, i'll go and get them before they walk in but actually mm. now we just kind of like sit and watch we hide <laughs> under, <laughs> under the table how desperate are they <laughs> <laughs> it was it was nice at the beginning but now we, we don't do it anymore and on um and on social media we had this thing that where people just ask us um uh, things that could be googled things that could be googled and or they just say hi can you give me your business plan and and we were always and and we received this like 300 times a, a day uh, or, mm. or um, a week and and we're like okay but so at the beginning we we're answering questions saying okay this is the type of egg model you need this is the size and 
a bit what we did with you when we started. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it makes us feel quite bad, honestly. We were answering all the questions uh, one by one, and then it just became uh, really too much. And people are, are not happy when we don't answer. Or when so now we have an automatic reply where we say, okay, if you if you're looking for information on. Uh, the farm, uh, we have uh, open farm tours on Saturday, those dates. If you're looking for information on the on the eggmobiles, you have uh, Richard's book, uh, here it is. If you're looking for information on the guest house, there is the, <laughs> the, the Airbnb page. And so now we have this kind of automatic reply where we try to, to, to yeah, address the, the questions in a different way. Hmm. We also try and keep, um, like, a, often if somebody calls us and says, okay, I'm a friend of uh, someone that we know, we're more likely to help because there's a, a sort of social capital that's exchanged. But in general, people who just send us messages to, because they need something from us, but there's no exchange. We considered saying like, uh, give a donation to an association if you want our time, at least there would be some sort of a, a value because it started feeling like we weren't actually valuable. Like what, what we did and all the work that we did and all the training that we did and all the, the blood, sweat and tears and the experts that we paid to be able to get here actually has absolutely no value and we should mm. just give it away. And so we were like, maybe we should get people to do a donation to something so that at least it feels like there's an exchange. Um, and we decided not to do that in the end because we were like, actually, it's more about like canalizing those mm. requests mm. and being very clear. And then I think this year we have managed the emergencies of tomorrow, but we also have boundaries. Yes. <laughs> so when we see a number come up, uh, we're ready. It's like, no, the farm is closed. No, listen to the podcasts, read the book, come to us with very specific questions. We're happy to answer those on a farm tour after mm -hmm. the, a very uh, mm. because otherwise we just land up being resentful and it's not a very nice feeling to be pissed no. every time you get a, mm. a a question on on social media because that one person isn't the problem it's just that yeah. like constant barrage of, mm. of stuff well yeah. i'm sure you have the same right <laughs> Well, I've developed the ability to be remarkably rude at short notice. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, no, I know what you mean. It can feel really harsh to, like, of course, you can put these boundaries. But it, I've been through a journey of feeling, like, really bad about having boundaries. And it's like, no, it's, of course, that's, like, normal and natural. <laughs> it's something about this field where people feel entitled to be able, because it's a farm. And I don't know, maybe it's just the alternative world lacks boundaries i guess that's a reflection i've had yeah. i think when it, i've been doing a lot of reading about boundaries this year and um i think one of the biggest things that came up was that like uh you need if you're going to put in a boundary you also need to feel okay with feeling guilty or okay with feeling uncomfortable because better feel uncomfortable than feel um resentful, resentful. or empty or angry you know, like you can deal with your own guilt. Or not That's, valued. Yeah. yeah, like it's much better to sit with that than to sit with mm. feeling ab like abused, basically. Yeah. Is that part of, I mean, it sounds like you've been digging into lots of juicy topics. Is that part of also managing like privacy and space when you have interns, employees, etc.? Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. We, we used to... I mean, the, the privacy, now we don't have a space for uh, to have lunch outside of the farm. So we're having lunch at uh, mostly at Claire's house because this is where we have our office. Mm. And, and uh, Gail's husband works from home here yeah, and, and there's no doors, so we can't all come in and out all the time. Uh, and yeah, and this has also been a, a bit of an issue for, for, yeah, for Claire particularly because we're all in, in her house, uh, me working, the rest of the team, you know, taking a cup, having coffee and then just stay there and it's it's a it's a bit uh it felt okay for claire at the beginning to say okay we don't have the space i'm, I'm very happy to mm. have uh, people here i like cooking so I'm, I'm i'm happy to do it but then you have all the effort of the work the the, the days are so full and at the same time mm. you become like a, a you know a mother of a, of a group of 10 people that constantly need you know to be fed and 
and directed and it's in, in, in your place. So you, you don't have a single space at the farm where you can just be alone for five mm -hmm. minutes. There's always someone. And for me, I have the kids in the morning and evening. So it's even worse it's because same, from yeah. six to nine p.m. there's no moment where I could be alone. So we said, okay, that's, that's really uh, affecting us, uh, our motivation and we're tired. We're just exhausted. We feel really, yeah. really as I said, mm. eaten by the farm and the people who are on the farm. Even if we have very nice moments, sometimes we have drinks, we sit around mm. the fire at night and, 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 and it's great. It's also, they give us a lot of energy to do the work during the day, but we feel drained at the end of the day. Mm. And so we said, okay, that's why we, we really need to mm. also tell people, okay, it's better if you have a space outside of the farm where you can stay. And we're building now an office that's not in Claire's house and a place where we can have lunch that's not in Claire's house so that people feel a little bit more independent. Um, yeah, and that I think it's also uh, like we've always run our, like our entire adult lives, we've run our house as an open house with our friends. Like we've always had people mm -hmm. coming in and out and everyone always knows where the, where the glasses are. And if it's dinner, everybody's jumping in. And so I kind of took on the same thing here, but then you realize that you actually got people that, you, you, that aren't your friends actually just random people, friends of people who are on the farm or, and you land up living with people that you haven't actually chosen to give access to your house. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. quite a thing for me. I was like, oh, okay. I always thought I was an open house kind of person, but actually I'm an open house kind of person with people that I choose. Fair enough, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, yeah, it's those, those types of boundaries are really important. Yeah. And then I think also between Gail and I, like um, also being able to know I think we, we've got a lot better, um, or at least I feel like I've got a lot better every time Gail was feeling a little bit down or a little bit um, upset or something, I, I automatically thought it was my fault. And so I would try and like uh, <laughs> fix things and stuff. And, it, and that's also a boundary thing, right? It's like, okay, I can ask you how you're feeling. I can feel empathy. You can ask me for help, but I don't have to take it on. And that's, and I think mm. you do the same, gets yes, mm. better at it to do it that way. But, um, you know, like it's also important that that person feels like they can feel their feelings without you jumping into like, oh, let me make everything okay. Mm. So mm. it's, yeah, it's been a big journey. I think we were talking about it this week to say like the farm has actually brought up a lot of personal development stuff that mm. we have. Yeah. And it's kind yeah. of brought it up in a very... <laughs> intense short period of time <laughs> yeah it really does sound like relationship like a marriage or something and yeah, in that yeah. Way. yeah. <laughs> what, what's been good because you said claire you've been reading a bunch like uh, do you have like resources that you found particularly useful or no. same to you girl there's a, there's a book uh, called uh, say what you mean Nonviolent communication um because Gail, you had trained already in nonviolent communication at yeah. work. And so she always saying, it's nonviolent communication. I'm like, I don't know what that is. So I went and bought a book, very good, by a Buddhist guy. Um, Soren, I think. Um, then um, a book, um, Set Boundaries, Find Peace, by a, psychi a psychologist, um, Glover. Um, super interesting about all the different types of boundaries physical boundaries, emotional boundaries, financial boundaries, like really, uh, really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, don't know what else I've been uh, reading. Tons of other stuff. <laughs> but it that really sounds really healthy and productive. And yeah. yeah, we do a lot of like, when we do our quarterly meetings with, I mean, it is a farm of girls, right? So we let ourselves into the emotions, like everyone brings their shit to the table let's be honest but um we we often do a, we take the list of emotions um and stuff and mm. there, there are emotions that like are not really emotions you're like i feel abandoned we found out through this book that abandoned isn't emotion it's it's a it's a blaming emotion and that's not part of nonviolent communication so we like try and find other words for it like a feel alone or I feel unstable or I feel uh, I'm capable, like I'm not confident or you know like those types of things which are it's super interesting to kind of go through and then we do it with our employees as well so how do you feel this morning like how do you actually yeah, yeah. feel and yeah, you take responsibility for your own emotions like you I think that was also learning is don't blame everyone around the table mm. but or we take on other people's emotions as your fault either it's the same yeah. it's the same part of it mm. But we, yeah, we also, 
uh, didn't take enough time for that. So we did it sometimes, but not on a regular basis. So the two of us, we do it all the time, but with the rest of the team, not, not, not as often. And so we said that this year, we're going to sit every week to have a bit of a, a moment mm. to talk to the team about what works, what doesn't. Um, you know, regarding community life at the yeah. at the farm, just to make sure it's otherwise people accumulate frustration. And we also had last year two uh, people at the farm who really didn't get along well, and it affects everyone. Uh, it's a small team, so mm. we want to make sure it's uh, and no one could pick up the no one could put on their big girl panties and talk to each other about it. Mm. <clears throat> what um, what's the pros and cons of running the farm as all women well we don't know because men don't want to come <laughs> to the farm <laughs> we just had three men coming to the farm and we thought we had found a, a man a man as an employee and in the end he decided to go to the chateau de chambord it's a, a, a different different type of uh, of place so we we, we hired a girl and uh, yeah we don't know exactly uh, it's it's um it's really nice honestly it's uh, we i mean we 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 make jokes about it all the time, but in fact, it's a really, it can be a very joyful place, you know, to have uh, women we, who feel good. Yeah, we, we know that a lot of um, young girls who are in their 20s feel really comfortable coming here, uh, like uh, engineer, uh, girls who, are, who study uh, engineering uh, or ag uh, agronomists. And they say that uh, when they go to places where they're men in farms or in ag companies, they feel unsafe. Or they, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know, like a, a lot of, jokes. oh, you can do the tomatoes in your bikini. Yeah. Kind of weird things mm. that they don't feel safe. So when they come here, they really feel safe. They feel comfortable. There's no, uh, you know, they just feel it's a safe place for them to work. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we like it. We're happy to offer this environment. They're very smart. Uh, <laughs> Mm. Uh, feminists, <laughs> yeah, nice. uh, and it's it's nice to have uh, to have uh, to be able to offer that space. Yeah, but it was. I mean, it's not a. For the two of us, it's uh, for me. It's very important that uh, we're known as a female-run farm because we came up mm -hmm. against so many different things trying to do this. Just a lot of kind of mm. really, who's going to drive the tractor? Mm. And um, and so it's important for me. Um, but um, that we stay all female is not at all important no. at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. And um, and but I think there are there are moments on the farm when we do do big uh, construction. We build a chicken caravan. Sometimes you literally have to say, okay, all the tools are in the hands of guys. Everybody put on the tools, and girls pick up the tools because naturally, mm -hmm. men will come and carry what you're carrying or do something that they feel like is a man's thing. It's not their fault, you know, but unless we say... Uh, is that a very French thing in in maybe. terms of like... Well, I noticed in Sweden, it's very much more like mm -hmm. economist in... Yeah, and I, I can relate it to my experience of England. You know, it's very stereotypical. It's very difficult when you're on a farm and the guys want to take whatever you're carrying, but your job is to carry stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's okay i can carry this if i picked it up i think i can carry it it's all right you know like and it's just it's um it's they are being so kind you know it's not that they are assholes at all it's just this like by you taking away what i'm carrying you're telling me that i'm actually weak that i'm not able to do what i'm doing and you're telling me i need help and i don't need help on this but I will ask you for help in carrying something that's incredibly heavy. Like, don't you worry. Mm. But there's an, yeah, there's an uncomfortableness around uh, the physical work that's involved in farming and girls doing mm. and trying to protect us. It's, it mm. comes from a very kind place. It's not. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's a deeply ingrained thing too. Often. Yeah. It's not that they're being mean at all. But uh, but it it can at the end of the day you can be like well. I just stood around and watched someone else carry stuff. I picked it up, but I didn't carry it. So, no, no, it's a, I think being, a, well, I don't know, we'll see, right? We'll see in 10 years time if we're still yeah. only girls. We have a, there's clearly a problem recruiting. We don't have a, an even recruitment. When we, no. when we have a response to a recruitment, we have 80% girls and 20% boys. Interesting. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we were hiring for the market garden as well. So I don't know, we had only interns ma men for chickens. Mm -hmm. or maybe it's a coincidence, but uh, I don't know. if next year we, a we change, we'll see. There's a tractor. <laughs> uh, we'll see if it changes. But uh, I also like, I mean, I like it. It's a, it's a, it's a place for women. But yeah, as Claire said, we're definitely not, <laughs> we're open to have men. <laughs> it's not, a, it's not a uh, girls only. Hmm. Hmm, interesting. What about, tell us a bit about the agroforestry there, because that was a big part of the original planning. You, I know you planted a lot of trees now. And how much is that part of the overall farm? Is that sort of just sitting in the background developing or is it? It's pretty much sitting in the background developing. I mean, we planted uh, 300 fruit trees in January 2020. With the koja? With the koja, so um, um, apples, pears, cherries. Um, um, uh, cherries, nice. thank you. Coin. Um, what do you say, coin? Uh, Quince. Quince. So very diverse. And uh, now the chickens are moving around those trees. Uh, we've had the first trees last year. So we'll see how it goes. It's not included in our business plan as a source of revenue, but we know that there is a lot of demand for organic fruits in the area and there's very mm. few providers. You have a lot of apples, but apart and from that, strawberries uh, maybe and strawberries, yeah. But uh, we know that it can be actually a great source of revenue in five years, definitely. But today it's not yeah. really included. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, like making sure it, there's not, there's not too many weeds. Uh, we prune them when we have to. That, so the yeah, chickens well do the job it. for us, to be yeah. honest. They do everything. Yeah. They do mm. the fertilization, mm. they do the weeding. So. And then there's a, um, there is a question of agroforestry and horses, because in general, paddocks are just pasture. Um, yeah. And uh, now with the climate change coming in, we have exceptionally hot summers, which are not usual. So we need it's natural shade. <laughs> it's impossible. But we did have exceptionally hot weeks. Yeah where we had to move horses down into a different paddock where there were trees and stuff. Right. So um, the region is subsidizing um, tree planting into horse paddocks. So we'll mm -hmm. do some of that as well, um, which um, I mean, I've just come back from South Africa and I spent a lot of time riding while I was there and um, our paddocks are almost 100% covered in trees. And I'd kind of forgotten. I was like, oh, this is nice actually to have horses mm. Cold shade rather than in blazing heat and um and i went to go see a guy that i rode with while i was there when i was when i was a teenager and um he said he he used to just plant by seed like acorns or acacia trees um he used to just walk around and just plug them in wherever and whichever ones survived survived um and he planted like thirty thousand trees in, in five years and it's amazing like I think like that's something that's also we can take off the pressure of like oh you must plant with a with a cover and a thing and a, mm. like actually if you plant it's enough mm. you can it can just do it without like if you just walk around don't worry about what time it is just throw the seeds in some of them will survive and it, mm. and it can make a really beautiful space Mm. I would, I'd like to see our horses and a lot more trees than they are. Mm. Mm. We planted um, on three hectares, so we still have uh, seven plus Eleven. four on <laughs> yeah. the other side, so there's still a lot of space to plant trees. Yeah. Tell us a bit uh, what's, like looking back from where you are now coming into the next season, if you look back at the journey so far, like what would you do differently if you started again? If anything, I don't I, honestly. I don't have a lot of things. Um, I I think like it would be nice, yeah, to put in a little bit more rules and structure. But I honestly don't think it would have been possible. Mm -hmm. So, like you know, you know, I'm not going to regret not doing it because I just don't think we were in a space. We wouldn't have achieved as much as we did if we had too many rules in place. Mm. Um, maybe we could have tried to put our tools down a bit earlier. <laughs> Yeah, the first year was really intense. The first year was really we're, intense. we're just because both of us have uh, have the tendency to be uh, when we're in a project and it's new, we get all very excited, and so we're really in it. <clears throat> and um, we burnt a lot of energy the first year, 
Claire was particularly tired the first winter. Uh, for me, it's this winter. It took me uh, another <laughs> two year, years. But two years. Girls got more uh, resilience than me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, maybe it, it would be just taking a bit more time off the first year. We didn't take holiday, maybe a week. One week, right. One week, and that was it. Uh, so maybe that. Last year, we, yeah, probably take more holiday the first year. But the second year, we did a lot. This year, we're doing a lot as well. So. Yeah. We've, we've got a, a schedule this year, yeah. so we already know which weekends you are off, and we're only nice. working five days. It's a amazing, week. and five days. Yeah, a week. yeah. from uh, and we yeah never more outside week. emergency crisis response. No, no, that's just someone Your door else is managing. Locked. It. <laughs> Somebody else is responsible, but one of us is always around. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Uh -huh. in those five days, um, and Nina's going to take chickens, and Karen's going to take the market garden. So. Mm -hmm. Sounds very reasonable and civilized. Very civilized. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it, for sure. I mean, you don't uh, you don't pay yourself minimum wage and then work all the time. So that makes sense. Well, I guess we all do in the beginning, and then we sort yeah. it out at some you point. Die. <laughs> in, the, in the startup phase, it's acceptable. And then you sell all your chickens, and you uh, decide to just grow your own food. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what's waiting for us in three years' time? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, it's super nice to chat with you and hear about how things are progressing. And I still hope to come and visit one day. <laughs> but now it seems like travel opens up again. That maybe I will do more of that this year or two. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But tell us a bit there. Uh, where can people find out about you? What's the best uh, places to get in touch or to see what you're up to online? Or, or you don't want them to, to get in touch. <laughs> I mean, because we have a website, a website that's a, <laughs> that is the, pay, the bone and of contention. Yeah. <laughs> we just have a landing page. That's it. We've never had time to build the rest of the website. So that's not <laughs> working. That's planned for, for <coughs> this year. Then we have an Instagram page, Facebook, uh, and, uh, and we have a newsletter. So you can subscribe on, on, the, the, website. Landing, on the landing page <laughs> of the website. <laughs> Great, but you've got beautiful photos up on your Instagram, so I can link it on there. And I think the important thing about the Instagram to say is that it, like we created it as a capsule, like a memory capsule for us, so that we can see what we did when, because we often use it to say, oh, when did we plant the tomatoes? Because we neither of us very good at writing a garden journal or, mm. or whatever. So it started with that as the intention. And so whatever Gil is putting up is very much kind of like what's happening today. It's mm. not. Um, mm. It's not like a. It's not. It wasn't created actually to become the sales channel, but it has been. But it's really. Mm. If you scroll through it, you'll see what happened when, mm. and how. That's perhaps the most interesting thing to follow, though, as opposed to super glossy. Yeah. Uh, glossy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> super nice. Thanks so much for taking the time to to talk with me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cheers, Richard. Thanks. Okay, hope you enjoyed the video, folks. I'll have more interviews coming up throughout the year, speaking to inspiring and well-informed farmers, and hopefully spread some inspiration as well as insights into the processes of running business, running family, running farms, etc. Don't forget, you can find out a whole bunch more in the links below. I'll put the girls' links in there too, if you want to follow their farm. Excellent work they're doing there. See you in the video soon.